Ash, welcome to the show. Rob, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am excited to do it. There's nothing more exciting for me than to do a podcast with my friends because the pressure is off and I can yeah. just ask you all of the questions that I've always wanted to ask without the pressure of um, feeling like I'm a weird, creepy friend at dinner going, <laughs> tell me about your high school years. But now I get to do that and I'm not weird and creepy. So thank you for letting Perfect. me do this. Yeah, I love it. Bring it on. All right. So I think a good place to start is uh, when we met each other at Lewis House's events. It's hard to pluralize his name. Um, you were working in fitness and you were living in Manhattan and you weren't exactly sure what you wanted to do with your life at that time. Could you give me a little color on yeah. what was going on in your head at around that time? Yeah. So funny enough, we actually met years earlier and you don't remember. <gasps> no, I, well, it was, it was <laughs> fitness, but I mean, yeah. it was like, that's like another life ago. Yeah. And it, I feel like that was like weird fitness related <laughs> stuff, but then it was like normal human stuff at the Lewis House event. So in my mind, I separated Perfect. it. I love how we compartmentalize. So for me, the normal human stuff was birthed out of the, the fitness stuff. And so at the time when we met, I don't even remember what year it was, but when we met at Lewis's event, I had just left my job as a teacher. So I was an elementary school teacher for eight years. And at the time I had been working as a personal trainer for about 15 years. And it was always a side hustle. I just did the training on nights and weekends to make ends meet. And over the years of my job as a teacher, I very often found myself creating businesses, which I didn't know that's what I was doing. I didn't grow up in a family of entrepreneurs. I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was. I was just sort of fulfilling. I got home at, you know, 325 and my husband got home at nine. And so I would make myself busy by doing things like blogging and training people online and writing eBooks and stuff like that. And so in 2016, I had this aha moment of it could be something and I decided to leave my job with no plan other than to do whatever I had to do to make ends meet. So when we bumped paths in Lewis's event, at Lewis's event, I just, I think I had either just left or I was just debating leaving. And the goal was just figure it out. I, I didn't really have a plan. It was work as a personal trainer because that's what I knew how to do and try to build this thing online, whatever it could be. So when you were, let's, let's first talk about elementary school. Why did you want to be a teacher? Was that one of those, I'll just like, why not? I get, you know, summers off and I'm home at three o'clock and it's just like, it, like it's a no brainer. It makes no sense. Or was there this, you know, deep seated passion? Like I want to be working with kids. Yeah. I never sought out to be a teacher. My parents actually sort of forced me to get a teaching degree to fall back on. You know, always, I say that always quotes. a fallback, right? Yeah, and um, I, I did it. I, I took it after going through school to be a physical therapist and dropping out of my doctorate program. I had a small stint in the fashion industry. I lived on my brother's couch in Manhattan, and it was at that time I was in my mid twenties, freaking out because all my friends were getting engaged and had real jobs and living in their on their own, and I was living on my brother's couch, and so. I sort of freaked out, walked into a school district and said, if I get the job, I'll take it. And I did. That's how I what, landed there. So there wasn't really a specific, like, I want to be a teacher thing. This was just sort of like, you were just going, the, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question is I think somebody who's listening right now, you know, it's very easy to see the you now and say, oh my God, you know, she's, she's done all these things and people who follow you look and, but, but there was a time where you were going through the motions and you were not doing something that you were like, you know, called to do or jumping over backwards so that you can get into. And I think, you know, I think that piece is important. Okay. So you mentioned that you were um, going to completely leave uh, fitness and mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you were going to completely leave the fitness. There was a point where you said, I'm going to leave the fitness business that mm -hmm. I've built and I'm going to go into business coaching. Yes. Tell me about that transition uh, from the perspective of why? Yeah. So it was around 2017 and I had left my job as a teacher, built my cute side hustle into a multiple six figure business. And a lot of the trainers that I worked with in New York city were just asking me how, 
How did I build a business online? Why was I always on Zoom? This was before everybody was on Zoom. You know, what was I doing on the computer in between clients? And so I just started helping my friends totally for free. I was just helping my friends and I was helping them build landing pages and, you know, create email lists and put together programs, which is one of my superpowers. I used to write curriculum for the district. So very good at writing curriculum. And so I was helping friends and they were all of a sudden making a lot of money and they were making a really big impact. And, you know, one friend had a a $80,000 launch and then a $60,000 launch and a hundred thousand dollar launch. And so I had this light bulb moment and it was just about approaching 2018 that I could put together some sort of business coaching program. But of course, imposter syndrome, because who am I to teach business? I've never taken a formal business or marketing class in my life. I just got results for people. Mm -hmm. And through being in my own masterminds and hiring my own coaches and just doing my own learning, lived experience, it was this question of, could I really do it? So in November of 2018, that's when I really, really went all in. So I was kind of behind the scenes helping friends for about a year until I had enough courage to say, yes, I can do this and I can help people with businesses and made that full pivot in November, 2018. So it's interesting. So pivots for you are, um, you're actually probably, I would assume, becoming more comfortable pivoting because yes. I see all these hockey stick moments, right? It's teacher and then boom, I'm not gonna be a teacher. I'm gonna go into fitness and then I'm gonna leave fitness and boom, I'm gonna go into coaching. And then I'm gonna co- like, like, so I'm interested to see where the next pivot is gonna be. But, but yeah. um, what is it for you when we think about pivoting? Some people feel like, you know, I view that as a failure. You know, if mm-hmm. I left teaching, it's a failure. If I left, you know, the fitness industry, it's a failure, you know, but you didn't seem to do that. Why do you think that is? So I only recently recognized it not to be a failure up until about four years ago. I did think it was a failure dropping out of physical therapy school and then fashion. And like you said, all these different things that I've done and it was in just personal development and having my own spiritual kind of growth journey that I realized this pivot, if you will, it's actually one of my superpowers and it's, it's not a pivot because I'm quitting, but rather I'm unlocking something new and I get to step into something new and I'm sort of shedding this old layer or version of myself and I'm embracing this new thing, which I don't know what it looks like. And for me, you know, when I left teaching, it was actually a podcast that was the thing that tipped, tipped the scale for me. I was driving to work. It was October of 2016. I will never forget it. I had my coffee in hand, driving to work on Route 287 in New Jersey. And I was listening to this podcast and this man was interviewing a woman who was a teacher and she made jewelry and she sold her jewelry on Etsy. So this episode had me fully embracing. Like, I mean, I was listening so intently. So she wanted to go all in on her Etsy business, but was afraid, you know, what if it doesn't work? I have pension benefits, summer's off, like you said. So he said to her, what if you gave yourself one year to try Etsy? If it didn't work, what would be the worst case scenario? And her response was, well, I would just probably go get another teaching job. It might have to be for a different district. But his answer is what changed my life. And he said, how does it feel to wake up every day and live in your worst case scenario? How does it feel to wake up every day and live in your worst case scenario? It's an interesting question. What was your answer to that question? I pulled the car over. I was hysterical crying. I text Mike and I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to quit. And that was my last year with no plan. I wasn't living in my worst case scenario. Of course, it could be way worse. I was a beautiful job, great house, you know, seven minute commute, but it wasn't my best case scenario. This is so interesting. Those, yeah, those hockey stick moments for me, are, it's that question of, well, is this my best case scenario? If it's my worst case scenario, if it's somewhere in between, it could always be better. This is really interesting for people that are listening right now. um, You know, you're at the gym or wherever you are and you're, you know, this is resonating for you. It may not be a teacher. It may not be in my case, a chiropractor. It could have been, it could be anything, but there comes a moment where not changing is actually worse than, um, than, than changing. And, um, my story is so similar to yours. I remember right exactly where I was. Kim, Kim came home from a yoga class and she said, that's it, we're done. We're selling the clinic. I can't take another minute of this. You're mm-hmm. miserable, you hate it, and we got to get it done. And sometimes those hockey, those, those painful moments create massive hockey stick growth. But if you let them pass, then you got no shot. So, um, so I love that. Um, okay, 
so you've created something that is um, called the digital business E plus revolution. Did I get that right? Evolution. Evolution. It's evolution. The plus is just a, it's just a little catchy marketing thing. It's for entrepreneurs, you know, in school, we got an A, B, C, D, F, but we didn't get an E. So entrepreneurs deserve the E, right? Well, that makes sense. Now, it, now it's yeah. contextual. Now I understand it. So walk me through <laughs> what that is and how you came up with that. Yeah, Digital Business Evolution is sort of the umbrella that houses all the different programs, products, courses, coaching that we offer. So I say we all the time because I have a team of 10 incredible coaches on staff. They're all graduates of different programs that we have, and they have come back to work in the programs. We have different uh, niche specialists, so that whether that's a lawyer or an accountant. Um, so really, it's a one-stop shop at DBE, as we call it, where you can come in and do everything from take your idea to really ideation through creation and, and scaling. So we have everyone coming in, just starting their business, all the way up to seven-figure business owners. All right. So let's talk about, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cough. It's not COVID, but I have a cough. I've tested three times, <laughs> but it won't go away. Um, for somebody Speak that- your truth. Who, just gotta speak my truth. Just let it's it. Just the, it's the throat chakra, I, you know. I know what I wanted to ask you. I wanted before we get into that. I wanted to ask you. You mentioned spiritual. Tell me mm -hmm. about your spiritual journey. Like, what did that look like for you? Lots of people are going through all mm -hmm. kinds of things. People, I've got people doing ayahuasca. I've got people doing ten day silent retreats. All kinds of stuff. What does that look like for you when you use the word spiritual? Yeah, I think for me, I grew up in a conscious household, as people would call it. So just at a very young age, I was going to sleep every night listening to subliminal message tapes. And my mom had me practicing visualization and she had sent me to a sports a therapist when I, I was a competitive gymnast. So we went to a sports therapist where we learned how to visualize and manifest. And so I just grew up in a household of Jack Canfield for Hanukkah and, uh, you know, the, the secret and, and all of that. We'd have book nights and that's what I would get, chicken soup for the teenage soul, right? That was what like my birthday a gift. parent? Was both your parents yeah. like that or just your mother? Both of them, but more my mom. She's an artist, a, a, a hippie for sure. So cool. <laughs> yeah, what so I grew up in a, in a bit of a conscious household and I have a brother who's five years older who took a, what would now be called a spiritual path. At the time, it was a um, searching for himself through external <laughs> external things path, right? But I watched him go through that at a young age and him playing around with it now is plant medicine, you know, yep. that's how it's referred to. And yep. um, so I dabbled in all of that at a really young age and had an eating disorder for about 11 years. And mm -hmm. when I worked through healing that eating disorder, when I went into an outpatient program it was in my early twenties, that's when I was really introduced to this concept of self-love and personal development and whether it is God, universe, whatever you believe in, it was finding something to connect to. So in my early twenties, I really started to deepen that relationship really to myself. Um, and then as I stepped into entrepreneurship, obviously that just was like Pandora's box to healing trauma and stuff, stuff that we get to work through. So it was more for you working out some of the demons that you had as opposed to you know, going off on a, uh, a retreat somewhere. Is that right? I think it's been both. I've tested, tested the waters with both. I haven't done a silent retreat, which that just sounds so hard. <laughs> I'd last three seconds. Uh, yeah, there's, I don't there's know. Not a, there's not a, not a chance I would. And, and frankly, I'm at the age in my life now where I don't really feel like I want to. So, yeah. you know, I, you know, we have all this like, you know, shooting all over yourself. I should do this and you should do, I don't, it's just like, let's just live the life we want to live. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So for somebody who's just starting out online and they're trying to grow their business, what should they not do? Mm. Wow. If they're just starting out. Okay. Number one thing that comes to mind because I'm really a course creator. I help people with courses don't build anything before you sell it. So don't spend time creating videos and making PDFs and modules for anything, whether it's evergreen or like a live coaching program, do not build anything unless you have actually sold it. Mm, and why is that? It's such a waste of time and energy and potentially money when you don't actually have the client sitting with you to help you navigate. So we oftentimes build what we want or what we think the client wants. And yep. so we spend all this time and energy and we build, 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 build. And then we go to sell it. And if it flops 
well, then we get stuck into the spiral of like, it didn't work. Why me? I knew I shouldn't have done it. Uh, the limiting beliefs and the self-doubt just really magnify when in reality, sell it first, consider it a prototype. This is what every successful company does out there, right? iPhone. What are we on? iPhone like 13 or 14 or something right Who knows? now? Yeah, yeah they, they weren't concerned. Apple wasn't concerned about making this best product. They just put it out in the marketplace. They sold it. They sold it before it was there. And then they continue to get feedback and they tweak it and they make it better and they add to it. So don't worry about like putting it all together and slapping your features on and then trying to sell it, but rather sell it first as almost a prototype or a beta. And once people are in your container, then let them allow you to help really navigate the speed, the direction, the needs, the wants. Um, that would be my biggest piece of advice. I think people are really concerned about that or confused about that because they look and say, well, how am I, like, I don't even have it. Like, how do I market it if I don't even have it? Like, I need to have this, you know, mm -hmm. I need all 10 modules worked out and all the PDFs worked out. And it's just not true. You can create that down the road. They're going to tell you what you want. And I promise you that the group that buys it is going to want different things and that you would have put into it. So I love that. It's great advice. Um, how should people approach growing their brand online? So I know that, you, you know, you've got a great brand online. You've worked really, really hard at it. Um, how do you think people should approach the brand components of this? Yeah, content, content relationships, um, I think people overlook the importance of content. And for me, we've grown our business to multiple seven figures organically. So it's always been organic content, organic strategy, organic, just relationships with people. And at the end of the day, people really aren't interested in buying a product or a service. They're, they're buying a relationship, right? People buy from people. So if you're looking for brand, it really is, who are you? What do you stand for? What do you not stand for? How do you want to show up? Who do you want to show up for? And then just getting your content out consistently. We know that that's so important. It's not sexy, but it's just putting out value and all content has value for the record. It doesn't have to be five ways to do X or let me teach you how blah, blah, blah. Right. If you scroll and you see a cat video that makes you laugh, that's valuable. So it can be anything from humor to teaching, to polarizing, to getting someone to think differently. Um, it really doesn't matter what type of value, uh, but it is just getting that content out and building that sort of brand voice and brand recognition. Okay. So I want to talk to you about constraints. So a lot of times we have these entrepreneurial ADD situations, right? Where we've got like, you know, I want to do this and I'm going to do that and squirrel and I'm there and, and we just keep going, right? But my experience is that people who put constraints on and they say, I'm going to work on a course mm -hmm. and I'm going to go after that, blah, blah, blah. What constraints have you, do you put constraints on your work where you say this year, it's perfect time for this, 2022, brand new year, I'm going to do this, this, and this, that's it, no more than that. Or do you have like in Q1, we're going to do 37 things, in Q2, 62 things. What's your strategy in that regard? Yeah, it's a blend of both. And I think it's really important for the listeners, for anyone listening to recognize that we're not all the same and not all entrepreneurs are the same. And whether you lean into something like Enneagram or human design or whatever that might be, there are different archetypes, right? We're different types of entrepreneurs. So for me, I'm not a CEO. I am not the CEO of my company. I'm a CVO. I'm a visionary. I'm a creator. And so those constraints can feel just like that. It can feel very boxed in for me where I can't breathe, which is how I felt when I left my teaching job. I felt like the walls were caving in and I couldn't breathe, right? So for me, I believe that structure creates freedom, which is counterintuitive. So a lot of people when they're entrepreneurs, we want the freedom to just do whatever we want and have an open schedule. But the things that allow that to happen are structure. So by my business having more structure and everyone knowing what their job is and things being automated, it then gives me more time and more freedom to go do whatever it is I want to do. So it's a little bit of both where the team and I sit down and we do have quarterly goals or we have a vision. Of course, we have revenue goals and we have a pretty solid plan for what we think is going to happen throughout the year. But then we also know, and everyone on the team knows, if I decide to scrap it, I'm the one who's helping. I'm telling the ship where to go and the team is helping us get there. So if I all of a sudden have this shiny object moment or squirrel brain where I want to go create something else, they know that like, okay, well, we might have to change things up. And, and that's just part of the job with the company that we have. Uh, because for me, that really is the alignment piece, right? And I think there's a very small line between doing what's aligned and what feels good and what you're lit up and want to create 
and then just having shiny object syndrome and doing something because like you said, you're shooting on yourself, you're comparing yourself to other people, or you see other people in the industry doing something that you think you, you should be doing as well. So that is part of the spiritual journey of being able to turn inward and say, okay, let me listen to myself for a second. Where's this coming from? Is this because everybody's doing it? Or is this because I'm really drawn to it? Or is this because the thing I'm doing isn't working and I'm trying to actually run away and distract myself with something different? So it's a, it's a blend of all of the fluid sort of feminine creative and then the masculine more structured approach. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, as I get older, there's, you know, look, I, like from your mom to, you know, making you read the, 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 the Jack Canfield's uh, chicken soup, you know, all the way to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. I have been, you know, bombarded with these are the six things to do, the three things, the two things for the marriage, for the body, for the thing, but you know what I mean? And at some point, like, I love what you mentioned that you're the create, that you're the chief visionary officer. That's what you said, right? Yeah. I love that because what you're doing is you're not looking for a prescription and you are allowing that spiritual side of you to take over and allow that to direct where you want to go as opposed to it being formulaic. And I think a lot of people are stuck. They see people like you who are really successful and they're like, okay, well, I'm going to. I'm going to get an RV and then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? And you can't, you can't do it because that is your path, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about um, the pandemic. So the sure. pandemic sque squoze you like it squoze me. And, you know, you, uh, you decided to, uh, to, to go into an 1100 square foot RV and I headed to Italy for pasta, right? We, so we all... <laughs> We, we did we did the same, but we did different, um, you know, so I remember um, that our mutual friends, Chris and Lori Harder said, hey, we're going to we're going to get an RV and, and we're going to go around. And I said, you know, Mazel Tov, uh, that <laughs> looks like fucking crazy. And, I, and he's like, no, 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 it's amazing. I'm like, dude, I love you, but it's never going to happen. Like, yeah. never. I'll meet you at the Ritz, but I'm not going to do that. Right. But you said yes. We're, we we would love to do that. Now, I have a personal question, and my question <laughs> is, how does a Manhattan chick yeah. from Jersey, like like yep. Manhattan, like you're like it's fucking Manhattan, like it's the center of the universe, and you're yeah. in this fakakta eleven 1 hundred square foot thing, schlepping like all over the. How did that happen? Oh, Why did God. it happen? Such a whirlwind, you know, you're asking me this question about a month and a half. I think it's been about six weeks since we've landed in Arizona and bought a house and we're now grounding and we're done with the RV life. So when you say it, it doesn't even feel real, but the reality is Mike and I did do that. We were living in a high rise, like you said, two bedroom, floor to ceiling, like the most beautiful 30th floor in New York city. And one night on a Zoom call with a bunch of friends, we decided, wouldn't it be fun if we left New York? And it came up because Mike at the time had a corporate job for 11 years that he was working with the same company. And during the pandemic, we went down to North Carolina where my brother lives and we stayed with him for about six weeks. And we were just hanging out there, living there. And Mike was working remote. And so for the first time in our lives, we got this taste of, wait a minute, hold on. Life could be different. Because before we lived in New York, we lived in New Jersey and we did, he did the commute back and forth, you know, the very standard hour and 10 minutes each way on the train with the briefcase. And so we just thought that that was our life because that's what we had been told or shown or society. And so when we were down with my brother in Asheville, we got a taste of life could be different. And so we started toying with the idea of what would it look like if I quote unquote retired Mike from his job and he came into my company. Now we always thought that we'd have to make X amount of dollars a year or have X amount of dollars in the bank for that to be possible. But the reality of it was we started playing with the numbers and it was like, actually, we could do it now. We don't have to wait. And the waiting isn't just about the money. The waiting is now we're putting off our life. So if we could do it now, where do you want to live? And so then this concept of where do you want to live came up and we had no idea. We just always thought, you know, Northern New Jersey or New York City, start a family. And so we started toying around with the idea with friends that we could Airbnb hop 
and we would go test out different places. We'd get a car. We didn't have a car in New York. We'd get a car and we'd Airbnb hop. And then that Zoom call kind of turned into like, well, what if we all got our Vs? Seeing Chris and Lori do it, we were like, that we must be able to. So that was on a Friday night, Saturday. We went to an RV place, which we never grew up RVing, camping, like you said, New York girl, right? So we went to an RV place to go inside and look at them and to see like, could we actually, could we swing it? Could we do it? And by Sunday, we had a deposit down. And a week later, we owned our very own 40 foot motor home and got rid of all of our stuff. Mike gave notice at work and about two months after we bought it, we hit the road and we were on the uh, road for 14 months. We did 27 states and worked full time. And it was incredible, amazing, and so hard. All right. <laughs> a thousand freaking questions, but I'm going to narrow them down to a couple. What was the best part? What was the worst part? The best part was the in-between. We call it the in-between. So normally you fly to a place, you land there, you maybe drive an hour or two away, and then you fly to a different place. And those places are usually cities. What we experienced this year was the in-between. So we got to see like the smallest, tiniest little towns that you would never go to, meet the coolest people, go to the best restaurants, like just see how other people live, meet people that we would never cross paths with. And it was, it was the moments in between as well. So there's the pictures at the national parks and then there's the in-between that wasn't even captured on social media. So were there any moments where you two said, what the fuck are we doing? Like, <laughs> oh my like, God, are, yeah. like, are we like, what the fuck? Like what happened? Like I'm, a, I'm on a, now I'm in, I'm on a zoom call and now I'm in God, God knows what New Mexico in yeah. a, in a, in a park. Like mm-hmm. I quit my job. What am I like? What am I doing? Was there Rob, any of that? All the time. All all the time. The time. Okay. Especially for, I think, we both went through seasons of like where it was harder from one than the other. So at the very beginning, let's not forget, Mike left his job, his corporate job. He had I know. Just gotten promoted to the job that he had been working for for years. And so yeah. the identity of that and the ego of all of that to put that down and then transition into working with me. And then we would wake up one day and, oh my gosh, like, what did we do? We blew up our life. Where's all of our stuff? And we're just like in, like you said, New Mexico, or, or you said park reality. It's a parking lot. We lived in parking lots. Let's. Call I didn't know what I felt like. I was going to be. I felt like I was going to be insulting if I said trailer no, park. I was. No. I don't know. I didn't know what the word was. That's what it is. It's not a trailer park, but they're parking lots. This glorified, sexy version that you see on the internet of like the RV parked on the side of the mountain with the babbling brook. Listen, we had a forty foot motor home. We were not on the side of the mountain ever. We were not off roading. We didn't have van life. We had a beautiful luxury bus, like a New York city transit bus. This thing was not going on back roads. So we had moments all of the time like that. Um, I had many, 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 many breakdowns, many, anything from Wi-Fi issues, which sounds like, Oh, such a first world problem. But the reality is we live in a first world and we run a business online. So it's a big problem. Um, missing people, feeling extremely isolated. It's cool. You get to meet all these people, but there's no center. There's no grounding. It took me the three months in, we almost quit. And around eight months in, I finally recognized this pattern of, I can't be grounded. So stop trying to force it. This is a season of flying. Like I will just not feel grounded in this season. I have to be okay with that. Um, But there were a number of times where we wanted to throw in the towel and just run back home. And that was the easier thing to do. I guess the question I still don't have answered <laughs> is why? why like, if you, like if you asked me, if you said to me now, okay, you're in Italy. Okay. Cause yeah. I moved when you moved ish. Yeah. I can give you like a thousand reasons of exactly why this is like the most perfect, unbelievable thing. And there's like never a point where I'm like, get me out of here. I want to leave. I want to go back to, to America and eat Doritos, you know, because I miss them or never? something like that. But for you, it almost sounds like it was a, um, a, a, a goal that you were navigating to see if you could do it. Is any of that true for you? So we very clearly had said to each other, like, if we're done, we're done. We don't have to prove anything to anybody. We don't have to prove anything to ourselves. We don't have to hit a year mark. Like that never came up for either of us. It was the most growth we've both ever done separately and together as a, as a couple. Um, 
And it was just the chapter, it was just the season that we needed to be in. It was the only way that growth would have happened. It could not have happened in New York or at his job. It just wouldn't have happened. We had to be disassociated from all of those things. And the ability, we don't have kids. So the ability to experience something like this where we could just pick up and leave and travel the country. And I mean, 27 states, I think we did 14 or 15 national parks, plus, you know, all the other regional and small state parks, like it was just the most incredible experience. We were completely off the grid for 14 months. Like no one actually knew what we were doing or where we were. Our families would even like, what are you, where are you? I mean, there were days that we didn't have service completely off the grid. It was incredible. So, okay. Uh, one more <coughs> on this and I'll leave you alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> was there, was there a moment for you where you started to disconnect to your current life at such a level that your friends started to move on with their lives? And it was, it was like you and your man and you guys were on the road and maybe you got an occasional text from your parents or a friend here and a friend there, but they moved on because you, yeah. you were gone. Was, was any of that part of this for you? Yeah, it was. Can't really pinpoint when, but I will say that actually started happening in 2017 when I left my job as a teacher and we left the white picket fence in New Jersey and all of that. Um, at that point, that gap started to kind of get larger. Again, we don't have kids. We're in our late thirties, we're almost 40. And so all of our friends, all of our friends have kids. They're, they're yeah. 10 year olds, you know? Um, so I think that distance had already been put in, in our relationships just because we don't have that many similarities. And when I say friends, I mean the friends from like home and college. When I look at my entrepreneurial friends, these rooms that I invest in to get in, it's a different story because they're in a very different space. They're much more similar to us with the time mm. freedom, education freedom, maybe not having children or whatever that looks like, working on their businesses. Um, but our people, as we call them, like our, our parents, our families, and our friends from home, the distance has definitely gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over the years. And then yes, during RV life, we even said to each other, we almost feel like we ditched everybody. Like we ditched reality. Like that's how we felt. We just said goodbye. We peaced out and we just like ditched the reality. And the interesting thing too, a lot of people will ask, how did we pick where we were going to go next? There was a couple of different things that would line up if we had to be somewhere for something like a mastermind or if we wanted to visit certain people, but really <laughs> we chased 75 and sunny. So we skipped winter and that was awesome. Right. But we just chased really nice weather. We chased outdoor activity. And for us, we chose to be pretty much in States that were open and so that we can enjoy the different activities or stores or restaurants. So we really do felt, I, I feel like we sort of just skipped out on like a year. So I, I can probably do three hours in a car before I'm ready to kill myself, <laughs> right? Like I, I'm no shit. Like, like I have a three hour rule. If it's more than three hours, I'm hiring, flying, training, something, right? I can't do it. Yeah. How many hours at a clip mm -hmm. were you sitting there going from one place to another? Yeah. So we had a rule. We learned pretty quickly. Four to five hours would be like a max driving day because four to five hours in the RV would actually be like a seven or eight hour day. Um, four to five would be the, pretty much the highest we would go. We try to keep it short if possible. And that would also determine where we went next. So if we could only drive about four hours, it would bring us X miles, which would bring us to the next spot. Mike did all the driving. Everyone always asks. I never, ever, ever drove it once. Um, I drove one in the parking lot before we bought ours, which was the same, but it was not our actual vehicle. So he did all the driving. I would sit and just work on my laptop. I had a desk and, uh, it was great. You're, you're, you're Madonna back there and he's driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> Literally. Okay. All right. I got it. I got it. Um, how, what did you learn about that man who was driving you during he's that incredible. time? He's incredible. incredible. I mean, I, I already, I already knew that. Um, just down for any adventure. I usually am the one, like I said, visionary, crazy, stupid idea. And then we'll make it happen together. So it was just a lot of that, uh, patience, communication. He's a better communicator than I am. He's always been. So he's taught me a lot on just communicating, right? If I'm frustrated, if I'm angry, if I'm upset. Oh, uh, communicating within the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but so even, even outside of, even outside of that, I mean, he was a manager, he managed people. 
I mean, I guess I did as a teacher, but they were very small people. Small you know, people. he just, yeah, he's very good at communicating. Mm-hmm. Um, we both got really good at detaching from the outcome. And we were both very a type A kind of control freak, you know, recovering perfectionists. And this journey led us to the path is the path is the path, right? And not getting so caught up in analyzing what's going to happen. Is it the right choice? Is it the wrong choice? It was like, if we go east, if we go west, it doesn't really matter because whatever we do, we're not going to know what the other thing was. And we were able to then convert that over into business decisions Mm -hmm. and relationship decisions. And so that was a really beautiful lesson this year. Um, He's really good at driving very large pieces of machinery. Didn't know that about him. (laughs) I mean, like who the hell knew? He could probably like if this if none of this business works out for you, he could do Seriously. he could definitely he has a skill he yeah. can use. Yeah. Um, so. All right. So let's let let's land the RV. So now you you, you come into uh, uh, well, two questions around. The, I know I've said two questions 12 times um, when you. What was it where you went? We're done, done, done. Mm. Like we're, we're it's over. It's really, really over. Tell me about that. Yeah. So it was around uh, the end of August and we both just, we just felt done. We were ready to be done. I think we also had at that point made our way up towards Montana. It was getting kind of cold. We had done all the parks we wanted to do. We saw literally everything we wanted to see. And it was, yeah, we just, we were done. It was a very clear, we we both woke up and we're like, "Uh uh-huh, we're done. But we also really wanted to do the Pacific Northwest. And so at the point we were in Montana, it was we can go west and shoot down the Pacific Coast Highway, Coast Highway and do like Washington and the rainforest and Oregon and all of that. Or let's just drop straight down from where we are back down to Arizona because we knew we were going to come back to winter here. And we sort of pushed through because it was like, when are we ever going to do this again? And we would really regret if we don't do this last stint. Yeah. That last stint was another two months and it was well worth it. It was actually some of my favorite places we went to. And uh, I'm so glad we did it. We also got a dog, picked up a dog on the way. So um, I'm glad we stuck it through. But the moment we pulled into Arizona, we were like, "Uh uh-huh, let's get rid of this. What can you tell me about the RV life that you've never shared before? (gasps) Um, Okay. First of all, we were not roughing it at all. And I sound so bougie, but we had two bathrooms. We had like a double sink in the master. We had a washer dryer, heated floors. I did not know that stuff existed. I, didn't. I thought RV, was, I didn't know. I thought RV life was like just van life, you know? Right. Um, what can I tell you that nobody, <sighs> oh, I, I don't know. I'm not prepared for this. What can I tell you that nobody knows? I think the, 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 just for me, the struggle of or the realization of environment is really important for me. Mm-hmm. And so the living in the parking lots and like being on top of your neighbors and emptying your own toilets and it just really affected me. <clears throat> Were there any weird cop stories or people that you met stories? Or... Oh my gosh, people we met. <laughs> we definitely met some interesting people. We met some amazing people, but we met some interesting people. We met people that had been doing RV life for 10 years full time. That's just how they live. Well, this is, you know, the, you know, the whole thing with Amazon and this, do you know about this? They have an RV program. No. So they have people that are into RVs and um, the way that they make money is they'll go from Amazon plant to Amazon plant and they'll like go and work during the day picking. And then they go back and Amazon has these parking lots for them. Is that crazy? Really? Yeah. That's it's, nuts. It's really it's bi- bizarre. There were kids but- picked up in, in school buses at some of our RV parks. Because See? people stay for so long that kids actually go to like public school and they get picked up and dropped off there. People live like this full time. Amazing. Okay. So if I, if I, if I gave you an RV today, and <laughs> go, go take a year off and go do it again, would you do it? At this very moment? No, uh, Okay. no, but uh, no. we, I'm not saying we'll never do it again, but we don't need to do it again. We've experienced it. I got it. All yeah. right. So now you're in Arizona. <clears throat> so we mm-hmm. go from, Manhattan girl to crazy RV couple <laughs> to now somebody living in Arizona. Yeah. Why Arizona? Mm, we just liked it. We had no intention. If when we were living in New York, if you would have told me that we would have sat there one day and just, we would have mm. never randomly said, Hey, let's move to Arizona. Right. We wouldn't have left the East coast. Right. Um, we, we just wouldn't, we, we yeah. wouldn't, he's from Massachusetts. I'm from Jersey. We just wouldn't have left. 
But when we were here last year, when we RV'd through Arizona, we just felt really good. So for us, like I said, environment matters. And that visceral feeling in your body, I'm sure you can relate to this in, in Italy. I know Kim feels this way. It almost feels home, right? You feel like your central nervous system just kind of calms down and you can feel grounded. So we did 27 states and only two felt like home. And Arizona was one of them. We also have an incredible community here and we love the weather here. And so we're just testing it out. I don't know if we'll stay forever, but you know. You love the weather when? I will take it even right now. Listen, it's you, at home today. Have you been in Arizona in the oh, summer? Oh, in the summer. <laughs> you, we've you only do, been, I know. We've you only know been it gets a little summer. warm, right? We're going to leave. We'll snowbird. Okay, good. Because it's yeah. Jupiter. Like you're living on <laughs> Jupiter right now. I know. I know. Um, okay. So you decided to, that you were going to change your Instagram handle. What yeah. was behind that and create a brand new account? Mm-hmm. What, what was going on there? I had been feeling the call for a while to kind of start a new account. So I'd started my account eight years ago and it was initially through actually network marketing and then it was fitness. And then it was uh, through fitness. I had built this little company, which was like retreats. And then the focus was back to fitness and then it shifted to business. So over the eight years that I had it, sort of the audience had shifted a lot. I had definitely changed. I mean, eight years, I'm a completely different person. And I really just had this call to be, disconnected, to be honest, from the old energy, the old content, the old beliefs, the old stories, the old audience members. Um, And so about three months ago, I took a new handle and I was going to start a new account. However, it was still my old name. So Jess Glazer, that's my maiden name. It was just a different variation of Jess Glazer. And I didn't start it. And I didn't know why I didn't start it. And my team kept asking like, when are you going to start the new page? And I had this resistance to starting it. And then we went home for Thanksgiving. And I was with my brother and sister-in-law who are very spiritual and tapped in. They live on the 5D. They visit the 3D. And so my sister-in-law, oh yeah, my sister-in-law had worked with a letterologist or a wordologist. It's someone who knows like the frequency of letters and how, when you combine them together, kind of the the energy and frequency at which they vibrate. And so my maiden name, Glazer, is an extremely masculine, powerful name. It's a very get out of my way, prove it, New York, right? Like get out of my way, I'm gonna prove myself, which for 37 years I've done. And that's how I felt. And through this RV life this year, I had what I call a shamanic death or like an ego death, another identity death that I put down an old version of myself and kind of grew into this new version. And it's a much lighter version and a version that I don't feel I have to prove, but rather I'm just, I'm here. And like, Mm -hmm. if you want to see the table, you can come, but I'm not gonna beg you. And so when she was telling me this, my married name is DeRose. It's a beautiful name, but I had never changed it because in business, I was already known as Glazer in the fitness industry, the magazines and all of that. And so I had this light bulb moment about a month ago, about maybe yeah, about a month ago. What if I change it to DeRose? It's, it's completely different. It's a different vibration. It's feminine. It's soft. It's a weight it's off lighter. my shoulders. I feel it's that. It's lighter, right? Yep, yep. And as I step into, you know, almost turning 40, I'm, I'm leaning into like, I can be Jessica. That's my name. It's my name. My name is Jessica. It's not Jess Glazer, right? So I decided with this new account, I'm going to use this new, but not new. We've been married for six years, this new name. And I'm going to have like a new voice, which is again, not new. It's, it's me. It's something I felt that I've suppressed for a while. I've been very vanilla on my account. And um, yeah, so I'm just totally fresh, no connection to old stories, content beliefs. And the other thing is I teach organic marketing. So after all these years of building this business, I also felt that the gap had gotten really far between myself and my clients. And so by starting a new page again, it gives me the opportunity to like really be in the trenches and sort of testing what's working for growth and what's not working and be okay with it not growing. And I think that's a huge thing. That's really cool. I like what you, I've never actually heard anybody put it that way. Like I was just, I was trying it on. I was Rob DeRose for a minute here. <laughs> I was thinking about what that felt like if I, if I, you know, you, we could get married, you know, I mean, I know you're married to him, but it's legal now. That's his dad. So, that's, that's my, that's my father-in-law. Right. Rob DeRose. I mean, that's, yeah. oh, is, is that, oh, is that his yeah. real name? Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a light. I like that. Maybe I'll, I'm, write, I'm writing a book now. Maybe I'll, I maybe love I'll it. write it. I'll write it under the name Rob DeRose. I like it. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, your life um, that may seem weird. So just roll with it. What do people often get wrong about you? Uh, they think I have tattoos. I don't have any. 
but I have a lot of piercings. Tattoos. Yeah, I have a lot of ear piercings and I have always worn a lot of like jewelry and very like rocker. So people assume I have tattoos. How does that come up? Do people say like, do you have any tattoos? Yeah, I guess if it's a question or people, people oh, will I just see. be surprised when they, yeah, see that I don't. I, I got often. it. That's, that's interesting. Um, what's one thing that you, I, I'm sure there's a million, but what's one thing that comes to mind that you've not gotten to? And if you don't get to this, you're really going to have massive regret. Like this is important to you and I've not done this yet. Um, for my personal life, it would be complete and total yeah. self-love. And for my business life, writing a book. Mm, two great answers. Um, what are some things that you're doing right now that you don't love? Like you're doing it and you wish you weren't doing it. Like you really want to release this piece. What comes yeah. up to, for you? Uh, still comparing myself and just some admin stuff in the business that it has me stuck behind the computer more than I want to be. Yeah, that's the number one answer to that question to admin. Mm -hmm. People yeah. just need to hire people. Yeah. Um, what is a new behavior or habit that has most improved your life? I can't say that it's new, but it's the number one thing that has shifted things for me, and that's meditation. Mm, tell me about it. What kind of meditation are you doing? So the last two years, I've been on a Joe Dispenza kick. Love so, him. Yeah. He I went to my lot. chiropractic school. Did he? Mm -hmm. Very cool. I do a lot of his meditations. Uh, you but do his I morning do one? I usually do the hour and 15 minute one. Did you ever do his morning one? I have not done the morning one. Oh my God, it's trippy. Just Google yeah. it. Do, okay. just go, you can go on YouTube and find it. It's really, yeah. it's his, like he does some really crazy stuff with his voice. Oh, his voice. Like, yeah. Like, you know, behind. <laughs> space between. Your eyes. Space. You're like, well, what? The, <laughs> you know what I mean? The space. I, the first time I did, I was like. Dude, man, you went crazy, <laughs> but it works. I get it. It does. He has one thing in his meditation that I absolutely, uh, every time I do a meditation, I do it. And it's, it's something like you say to the universe, when you're talking about what you want and you're, you know, stepping into it, you say to the universe, please give me a sign today mm -hmm. that only I would know that will encourage me to want to do this again and again and again. And it's this little thing I heard, I was like, eh, whatever. I mean, man, when I get there and I'm there, there's always something where I'm like, damn, that's that butterfly. <laughs> yeah. And then do you giggle or like laugh when you see it? Of course. Yeah, it's the best. Of course, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. What is um, an unusual or absurd thing that you love? Like people look at it and go, well, that's weird but you love it. Like, like your, I learned this about your husband. Your husband likes trans music, right? Well, that's our favorite, both of us. Both of you. I'm a trans yeah. guy, right? Yeah. I love trans. So yeah. what's something that's unusual or absurd that you love? Um, well, man, yeah, trans music. There's nothing better. Something unusual or absurd that I love. Um, I don't know if it's absurd, but decor, interior decorating, design, fashion, clothing. Yeah, all design stuff. Good. Come to Italy. Yeah. You'll really you'll fall in I love. Um, if you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Australia. Mm -hmm. I lived there for about eight months back in college, and it was just the most incredible time of my life. And I'd love to go back to see some of those friends and, and just, you know, make new memories there. That's where did you live in Australia? Newcastle. In Newcastle, is that um, near Melbourne or Brisbane? An hour north of Sydney. An hour so north of Sydney. East Coast. Okay. Mm -hmm. And would you ever want to live there again? Uh, temporarily, I would. I don't know that I would do long term. It's just mm -hmm. so far away. It's so far. And yeah. and is it very much like America? It was when I was there, but that was gosh, almost twenty years ago. That's the thing ago. that's kept me away. Yeah. Because everybody I talked to went says it's kind of like the States. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to get in the plane for 20 hours to see the States. I mean, I get the kangaroo and the accent, and everything, <laughs> but it just, you know, I don't know. It seems crazy. Are there any positions or opinions uh, in the last, last few years, or it could be way back that you've changed your mind on? You're like, you know, I used to think this way, but I don't think that way anymore, that this way anymore. I, I now think differently. What comes to mind for you there? Oh man, so many things. I used to think that knowledge is power, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's applied knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. 
I used to think that I had to be good at everything and that I had to be right all the time. And then I had to know all the answers to be good enough. And that's not right. I used to think that asking for help was a weakness. Of course, we all know that that's not true at all. Um, yeah, I have a lot of them. Good. No, that's good. Really great. Great. I love how you, you have access to it immediately. Um, okay. We're going to do a speed round. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Taking difficult concepts and making them easy to understand. Do you collect anything or have you ever collected anything? Oh, for sure. I, I used to collect these little stuffed bears. They were called Muffy when Muffy. I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> Muffy the stuffed bear. Uh, I currently collect friends though. I collect people. People. Okay. I just had this vision of like little people sitting on your shelf. Okay. You mean like you want, you want really humans. Men. Humans. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do people never ask you, but you wish they did? Uh, what, uh, probably what lights me up or what I'm working on next. Okay. What book have you reread the most? Reread. Tie between Secrets of a Millionaire Mind and Four Agreements. Yeah, that T. Harvecker. Do you listen to it on audio or do you read it? No, I read it. I'm not an audio girl. Well, this is one of those books where <laughs> it's trippy to listen to on audio because he's like, slap yourself in the head and say, I have a millionaire mind. And it's really like, it's really, he does it like at the end of every five minutes. So it's, it's an interesting audio book. Um, <laughs> two questions. What is your guilty pleasure? Chocolate and Netflix. Netflix is always in there. Man, there's a reason why that is a $10 billion company or something like that. They yeah. did it in five years. It's insane. Um, okay, last question. Let's change things up a little bit. What one question would you like to ask me? So you said earlier that you haven't had any moments of kind of uh, get me out of here. What am I doing? This is difficult and mm -hmm. in Italy. And I just find that so hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Not even like language barrier or anything. So what's something that's been the closest to difficult? Maybe it was before you left the States because I know we've watched you and Kim and we just think it's incredible what you've done. And people think we're crazy for doing RV life. I think you're insane for moving to another country, but that's coming from a place of, of envy. So what were some of the roadblocks that you had to come, you know, overcome before you were able to take the leap? Well, let me answer the first part of your question, which is sort of like what, hasn't been great, which is, is my interpretation of what you asked. Um, the only thing I can say, and it has really nothing to do with Italy, and it is probably a little bit in my head and a little bit true, I think. I'm sort of working this out. But <clears throat> the reason why I asked you that RV question earlier about like your friends like vanishing off the face of the earth is because it was a it was a reality that I noticed that happened. I, I am a people guy and I need, I need my friends. Like I need people around me and I'm very connected um, to people. And when we moved to Italy, <clears throat> it was almost like we moved to another planet. Like, the, like nobody texted anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody called anymore. Nobody Zoomed anymore. And they just went on with their life. And it, it became this really weird experience where I started making new friends, but they're new friends, like they're new. Like I don't know them, like I know people my whole life or five years or 10 years or whatever. They're, you know, they're just another expat going to the same school as my daughter or something like that. And they're amazing and we're great, but they're not my people yet, right? I'm not here long enough. So there was a, I don't want to say a pity party, but there was a little bit of a woe is me feeling like, man, like nobody reaches out anymore. And I guess if, you know, like I tried to look at it this way, if I was in LA or even here and one of my friends here said, hey, I'm moving to Germany. I, I think that it would be like, I'd be like, okay, he moved to Germany. Like, you know, like he's in Germany. Yeah. And there's something weird that happens when you move to another location that the people that are in your life and, and like I, I, some of these people, you know, are, are people that were in New York and I'm in L.A. 
And it wasn't even like, I mean, it's the same distance almost, right? right? But in their head, I was like in another planet. So that has been the hardest part for me. Um, <clears throat> the other part of it to sort of answer the broader question, I was, when you, when you talked about you being ready to move um, out of the RV and into, you know, a home, um, I was ready to move. My RV was America. I was ready to leave. And um, it was, you know, there were moments that were building. I, you know, in Hermosa Beach where we lived, we backed up to Sophia's school. And um, so we could sit on the balcony, our, our deck out there, not a balcony, but a deck overlooking the, the backyard. And then there was her school. And then one day, you know, we hear, get under the table, get under the table. Um, this is an active school shooter drill. And we're like, what the hell's going on? And they were training kindergartners um, to hide underneath the seat in case a school shooting happens. And I went, you know, I'm 55 years old. I, I there was no, nobody got shot in schools. It didn't yeah. exist. And now I don't know how many hundreds happened last year. And we don't even talk about it. It's like, it's right. Tuesday for us. Um, and then there was massive divide politically uh, with Democrats and Republicans where I, you know, like it used to be when I was a kid, if I talked to somebody who was Republican or Democrat, um, it was never fun, but it was never hateful. Yeah. Now it's like, it's so divisive. So divided, yeah. It's just so divided. Um, and, um, you know, then the, then the Capitol was stormed and I was like, what the hell is going on? And I'm watching Trump and I'm like, this is like a shit show. And I just went like, do I really want to raise my kid in this craziness? Like, what am I doing? And then everything was confounded because of COVID. We're all home and you couldn't, we couldn't leave. And then I go to the beach and somebody wants to write me a ticket because I'm wearing a mask, but I'm wearing a wetsuit coming out of the water and they want to give me a ticket because you got to wear it at the beach. It was like, it, it's so nuts that I'm like, I can't, I, this is like, this is crazy. I can't do yeah. this anymore. And when I got here, it was the opposite. It was I went from, you know, like walking over to somebody where I'd get like this half hearted, like gay fist bump <laughs> and like I come here and they're like giving me wet kisses on my face it's and they're like, mama mia, what a hair, look at the hair on this guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it was like um, walking into dinner and the, 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 like the conversation, like my conversations mm -hmm. are about wine and art and food and family, and, <clears throat> excuse me, culture. And I, I didn't have any of that. So for me, the reason why I'm so pro-Italy is yeah. because I was so anti where I was. I'm not anti-American. Like I've just, I didn't like the environment I was in. I love America. That's what yeah. makes it so hard. I didn't like that environment. So when I came here, it was like so different. Yeah. But there's a bit of a honeymoon stage. Ask me in a year, who knows? Yep. Right now, right now I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the scarves, I mean, the scarf collection is just, it's Listen, next level. Come on. Who's got more scars than me? Are you kidding me? I can do, I can do knots that will make your head spin. <laughs> Jess, do you have any final, Jessica DeRose, do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for people that are listening? I uh, just, I appreciate you so much for having me on. Thank you. And thank you to all the listeners. If you want to connect, I'd love to connect with you over on my new account, which is I am Jessica DeRose. So come on over there. And, uh, you know, we talked a bit about a lot of different things today, but I'd love to drop a free, a free training for your audience. If you'd be open to that. Of course, let's do it. Yeah. So it's the beginning of 2022. And we thought what better way to put out a free piece of content that is actually all around five ways that you can bring income in today. So it's without launching or creating a new product, but five really simple ways, even if you're not a business owner that you can create cash fast or an additional stream of revenue. And so I'd love to gift that to your audience. Amazing. We'll link it all up in the show notes. Jessica, thanks, Jessica, thanks for being on the show. Thank you.